one, it's Hannah here. If you ever thought about where you can come see us live at any events around the country, go check out our website, www.themoneymultiplier.com. Go to the events tab up at the top page uh, on the homepage, and you can see where we're coming to next. So uh, reach out to me if you have any questions, and I hope to catch you on the next live event that we'll be doing. See you then. Hi, Money Multipliers. Welcome back to another episode of the Money Multiplier Podcast, where we talk about do your dollars make sense? I'm your host, Hannah Kessler. And today, our topic that we're going to be diving into is term versus IUL versus whole life versus IBC. Yes, I know that's a lot of moving components there, but we're going to break it down. We're going to make this super easy. Um, I am here reporting live yet again from the van. I'm here uh, still in Colorado. So actually, I've been here for about a a month or so now, a little over. And uh, I'm kind of waiting it out because uh, my best girlfriend and I, we have tickets to a Red Rock show. And if y'all haven't seen the venue of Red Rocks uh, near Denver, Colorado, y'all got to check that out and you got to go see your favorite band there. So uh, we're going to go see our favorite musical artist. Her name is Closey. And and, uh, Closey, she's actually from France. So uh, she'll be in and uh, we'll be sitting there right in the third row. So I'm really, really excited about that. So that's coming up. But uh, anyways, let's rock into it and let's talk about it. So with with topic one, right, what did I say? Term life. What is term life insurance? And, you know, this episode is going to be mostly for uh, the folks who are new to the whole life insurance world. And now term life is one of the most without lack of better words, basic life insurance, right? So everybody kind of understands term life because most of the time, a lot of people have it. And why do a lot of people have this term life? It's cheap, right? So term life insurance, what that means is that you have this set amount of time or term, whether it be a 10-year term, 20-year term, 25, 30 year term, and you have this set death benefit through that amount of time. So for example, if I purchase a 20 year term policy and that death benefit is a million dollars, that a million dollars will be on my body for that next 20 years. It's a level death benefit. It'll be on my body for the next 20 years, that $1 million. And I, if I just keep making those premiums, I'll have that a million dollars of term, right? Like I said, people like term because it's cheap. And in my opinion, it does make sense in some scenarios. What I personally like are the convertible terms, right? A lot of people don't know about this one, but there are some companies and some products out there that if you want a term policy, let's make believe that right now you are just not ready to start your IBC policy, but it's important to have that death benefit on your body for your family. Um, Let's make believe you're a firefighter and you have uh, four children and a a spouse, right? Well, maybe that is important to you because of your quote-unquote risky job that you have as being a firefighter. So a convertible term, what's cool about those is is that when you're ready, you can convert that term into a whole life up to that death benefit that you have and not have to do any additional underwriting for it. So again, some people like this option because it really does lock in that insurability of that person. Like, let's make believe, God forbid, in three years from now, you get diagnosed with cancer. Well, because you have that convertible term policy, you can still convert that into a whole life when ready, even though you have the cancer because you locked in that insurability. So I thought that was pretty cool. And I think a lot of more people need to be talking about that. But uh, convertible term, now let me be 
clear, it does vary from company to company. You cannot convert, um, let's say, a Northwestern Mutual policy, a term policy, into a mass mutual whole life policy. That does not work. It has to be within that same company. But there is one company out there that does take up to 500000 of death benefit, convertible term, and you'll be able to convert that into the new new company and not have to still do any uh, additional underwriting. But anyways, I'm getting into the weeds there. We can talk about that on a one-by-one -one basis if that's something that uh, uh, resonates with you. So that's term life, right? And why do we know term life? Let's just talk about it. Let's talk about the pink elephant in the room. Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman, right? Isn't there that ideology out there to buy term and invest the difference, right? Because when I buy term, it's cheap. And then whatever leftover dollars that I have, I'm going to go invest that into X, Y, and Z, whatever I want to invest in, okay? So that's term, right? And in my opinion, term is nothing more than renting insurance, is it not? Because each time that you're making those low ongoing premiums into the policy, all you're doing is renting that death benefit for that set amount of time. It does not build you any cash value. And then the downside to term is, is that, you know, let's make believe I get this policy. It's a 30 year term policy. Let's make believe I am 20 years old right now. Well, in 30 years, I'm going to be 50. So at 50, that term is going to expire. Well, when that term expires, what's going to happen? If I still want the death benefit, I'm going to go have to buy another policy. Well, what happens when I'm 50? I'm older. The cost of insurance is higher. I may have some health concerns that make me illegible to get coverage, right? So, so the later down the road, we don't know those foreseen circumstances that are going to come. So we don't know if we'll be able to qualify for more term. And yet again, it is going to be more expensive later down the road because you're older. It just makes sense, right? The cost of insurance gets higher when we get older because we're getting closer and closer to the graduation date of our life. So that's term. Let's talk about the next one. I-U-L. A lot of folks love these IUL products and they can make sense. I mean, in, in some scenarios, maybe, but, but IUL, what does that stand for? It stands for indexed universal life. Okay. What an IUL product is, and actually let me reference you a, a page here. So actually, if you turn to Nelson's book, Becoming Your Own Banker, in Nelson's book, I believe it's page 36 or 38. And Nelson does tell you his thoughts on uh, uh, the IUL products and those universal life products that are out there. So what an IUL policy is, it's nothing more than just a one year term insurance where the cash account on the side gets invested into the market. So what that means is, is that each year that you have this IUL policy, that cost of the insurance is going to become greater and greater. I mean, just take a look at it. Uh, if you go look at any IUL illustration and you look at the guaranteed side of that policy, you'll start noticing around the ages of 65 to 70, your cash value is going to start to go down and your death benefit is going to start to go down. Because what's happening is, is that the cash account that we have on the side invested into the market, that thing is not going to be sustainable to keep up with the ongoing expense of the cost of the insurance. So what happens is, is that it takes that cash account on the side, it takes some dollars away from that to pay for the cost of the insurance. So that's why you see the cash value start to decrease and the death benefit starts to decrease because we're not making those hypothetical returns because yes, they are hypothetical, right? In the market, we all know this, the market can go up and it can go down, right? 
And so we don't know what's going to be those hypothetical returns 30, 40 years later down the road. We don't know what that cost of insurance is going to be. You know, actually, there are some studies out there that some companies have been jacking up their interest rates on, or excuse me, not interest rates, or I should say the cost of the insurance on those IUL products because they have to. The economy is always changing. Inflation is coming in, right? We're not tied to that gold standard anymore. All we got are these fiat dollars. And if the government keeps uh, pumping and pumping more cash and printing all this money back inside of our economy, yes, prices are going to be larger and the insurance companies need to supplement for that cost of insurance for you and for the rest of the company. So, in those IUL policies, right, it's nothing more than a one-year term insurance where the cash account on the side gets invested into the market. And really, honestly, these products really did come out in the 80s. And why they came out in those 80s, um, in late 80s moment is, is because they the companies needed to come out with the product that was going to compete with the high interest rate environment that we were in at that time. Nobody was buying whole life, right? Because at the time, whole life was a guaranteed four percent why would I go put my money inside of this guaranteed four percent vehicle if I could take my money go buy this other life insurance product and then go out and still invest my money into the market and make these eight percent returns in the year right that was the idea behind it but again, it's we're not thinking about the longevity of that policy itself so let me say one thing do I think there's one silver bullet out there for everybody? Absolutely not. Everybody's different. Everybody's at their different financial positions in life right now. So in those IUL products, yes, they can be a useful tool for some folks, like let's say for retirement purposes. But if you do not properly manage that policy, that thing can totally implode on you. And let's just let's just be real with one another. Who out there is honestly managing their IUL portfolio? Most of the people nowadays, what they want to do is they make their money and then they want to go and give up that control to their financial advisor. And they say, hey, here, Mr. Advisor, you go take this money, go do X, Y, and Z with it. I want to invest in a moderate uh, uh, risk category with my investments. Tell me what you get, right? Most people are doing that. Do you think those are financial advisors are going in each and every year seeing exactly how that IUL policy is working, how the call option prices are going up each and every year? Probably not because they want to keep that thing and they want to keep it in your portfolio because they want to keep making that 2% fee commission on you, right? So anyways, just to get you to think about what's going on. Now, let, let, let's move on. And actually, one more thing I'll say before we move on. If you do want to come to me and ask me about different resources on IULs, because I know, you know, like I said, when you're getting into this world, there are those different products out there. If you come to me, I do have more in-depth resources on IULs because I know that's a big uh, topic that keeps coming up in this world of infinite banking. So uh, please send me an email, hannah at themoneymultiplier.com, and I can send you some of those resources. Um, and honestly, the mathematics too. We even dive into the illustrations of it, how it's honestly per performing, so on and so forth. So let's talk about no topic number three, whole life, right? What is whole life? Whole life is what's classified as permanent insurance. Permanent insurance means is that you're going to have this policy for the rest of your life. So what this means is, is that the whole life policy, in, a, in essence, you're basically betting with the insurance company. Kind of opposite to term life, right? Where term life, we're kind of betting against the insurance company. Where we're saying, hey, hey, uh, Mr. Underwriter or Mr. Insurance Company, you know, nope, I am not going to live for the next 30 years. And during that 30 year time frame, you're going to pay my family this death benefit, well, the insurance company is saying, well, Johnny boy, I hate to tell you this, but you are going to live past that 30 year t uh, time period. And that's why we're OK to give you this policy, because truthfully, if the insurance company really thought you were going to pass away during that th that set of term, would they even give you the policy anyways? Probably not. 
So in a whole life policy, this is you betting with the insurance company. Y'all are both investing, in a sense, with each other and going towards the same direction. Because it's true, we're all guaranteed to pass, die, and graduate, right? So we're betting with the insurance company going in that same motion. So whole life, actually, it's been around longer than our tax code's even been here. Our tax code's only been here since 1913, so in this in this whole life policy, we have a guaranteed permanent death benefit. We have guaranteed permanent premium, right? Premium. What I mean by that is, is that later down the road, 20, 30, 40 years from now, your premium is going to be the same as when you started it at age 20, and that's where a lot of co the controversial comes in at because a lot of people think that, you know, oh, I don't want whole life. Whole life is a terrible investment and it's just too expensive. I agree. I also agree that term is too expensive because what you're doing is you're throwing dollars out the door that you're never going to see again. It's kind of asking you the question, well, hey, why are you going to go buy that house and why are you not renting the house? Right? What is the obvious answer there? Ownership, control, same thing with the policies. So, in a whole life policy, like I said, we have the guaranteed death benefit, the guaranteed premium. And what I mean is, is that that premium is never going to increase at any time throughout your entire life. It's going to be that set ongoing premium. So, that's whole life. And, let me add, it's not invested into the markets. It's not dictated on any external factors. Truthfully, the biggest risk factor in those whole life policies is you and how you use the policy. You could stop making the premiums, right? And the policy surrenders on itself. You could keep taking out, let's say you build up cash value. You keep taking loans and loans and loans from the policy and you never pay a single penny of interest or, or principal back to the policy. Absolutely. That could start eating away, right? But who's doing that? You. It's not the market that's telling you to do that, right? So in those whole life policies, we have to understand that you and what you do with the policy is really going to shape your whole banking ecosystem when we talk about using whole life, okay? So now with whole life, right? Let me just touch on this just for a second, because here's one question that I will get sometimes, you know, that people ask me, well, Hannah, what, what's the what's the worst thing in, in the whole life policy? What is the worst thing that it can do? Well, the worst thing that it can do is that the insurance company gives you that guaranteed interest, right? So the worst thing that policy can do is that they give you that guaranteed interest and you do not receive your dividend that year. That is truthfully the worst case scenario inside of that policy. Because at the end of the day, you are entering into this contract with the insurance company. The insurance company can never change the rules on you, tell you no, you cannot take out a loan. Because let me remind you, who is the owner of those whole life contracts? It's you. You're the owner. You have first rights to all of the equity inside of that policy. The insurance company is nothing more than just the administrator of that policy. So, a whole life, okay? It's boring. I love how boring it is, honestly. It's boring. It's, it's not very fun to talk about, right? It's not very sexy, right? That's why people like IULs. It's more sexy, right? Hey, I can get an 8% hypothetical return over the next 20 years. Okay, let me ask you this. Is that an average rate of return or is that your actual rate of return? All right. Now, now that we've covered term life, IULs, and whole life, let's talk about the infinite banking concept. The infinite banking concept is a process. It's a concept. I'm not here talking to you about a product. I'm here talking to you about the process and the banking function in your life. So if I take the infinite banking concept and I go to term, can I practice infinite banking with a term policy? Well, no. Term life doesn't build cash value. I don't have ownership. It's just me renting this death benefit until that set term expires. Let's move it to IUL. And an IUL policy, can I use this for the infinite banking concept? Some may argue yes, but 
If you, if you truly are a follower of Nelson Nash's teachings, no. An IUL policy cannot be used for the infinite banking concept. If you're using an IUL to do banking with, you're using an investment to do banking with. Because, right, it's kind of like in the same way of like cryptocurrency, okay? So let's make believe, and I know we might be heading down that world, but let's make believe that we're in Walmart today. All right, so we're in Walmart and the whole entire economy, we have digital uh, cryptocurrency, okay? And that cryptocurrency, right, we know that that cryptocurrency is very, very volatile. It can go up and, and three seconds later, it can go way down. And four seconds after that, it can go to the moon, right? So let's make believe that we're in Walmart. We're in Walmart. We're in the back of the store. And uh, Daisy, you know, she needs some more uh, uh, kitty food. She needs some more kitty litter. You know, maybe I'm going to go pick up a, a uh, pack of, of craft beers, my favorite thing. And uh, maybe we're going to go and, um, I don't know, buy a box of uh, uh, pizza for ourselves tonight, right? Whatever. We're in the back of the store. We're buying our merchandise. So what we do is we check our cryptocurrency. All right. I have exactly uh, uh, $100 in my cryptocurrency. Okay. All right. I can, I can fund for this transaction. I got enough cryptocurrency. Well, now we walk to the front of the Walmart. I go up to the counter. I put my merchandise up there and get this. I checked my cryptocurrency. Oh crap. It just dropped by 60 bucks. I don't have enough to buy my merchandise now. What am I going to do? This happens the same thing in your IUL policy. Matter of fact, just getting into a little bit more of detail here, some carriers and some companies of how they, they engineer these IUL products is, is that it, it, when they have that cost of insurance, some companies do it on an annual basis where that cost of insurance renews. Some companies, they do it on a monthly basis. Get this. If you have the, the exact change, and let's just say a penny over in your cash account on the side in your IUL policy, you have that exact change, just one penny over in, inside of your cash account on the side there. And now the next month rolls around while well, the insurance company looks at your cash account and they say, yep, you got enough money in there. You can pay for the cost of the insurance this month. They take out that money from the cash account. They go pay for that cost of insurance. And then what, what do you have left? You got a penny left and that's going to sit there and be invested into the market. What happens next month? Next month, if you don't make those returns in the markets, you're going to have to start coming out of pocket with more premium dollars to fund the policy, to sustain it and keep it alive, or your cash value is going to start to go down and your death benefit is going to start to go down. So it's just not the proper vehicle to practice infinite banking with because of the vol volatility in it. Now, I understand there are a few folks out there that are so gung-ho with their IUL policies. Y'all look at it, at it every single day. You properly manage that thing. Yes, it might work for you. But I'm telling you, with the masses out there, y'all are not going to look at this every single day, every single week, making sure, hey, do I have enough cash in my policy to help cover for the next month's cost of insurance? You're just not going to do it. Don't lie to me and don't lie to yourself, right? Now let's go to the third one, whole life. Whole life policy in the infinite banking concept. Whole life policy has a guaranteed interest. We like that. The premiums are guaranteed. We like that. And we like that it's not going to go up and down based on other factors that are playing into the equation here. Because here, here's, my, here's my definition of an investment, right? Because like I said, we're, we're talking about quote-unquote products here, term, IUL, uh, whole life. But really what I said is the infinite banking concept is not the investment. It is your process that you're making your transactions and your investments. So my definition of an investment is it can go up and it can go down. In a whole life policy, that thing can never go down. Because what did I say earlier? The worst thing that can ever happen in your policy is, is that the insurance company gives you the guaranteed interest that you are owed that year. That thing can never go down. A whole life policy is classified as an appreciating asset. So that is why we want to use the vehicle where it's, like I said, it's boring, it's sturdy, and it's stable. 
I want to keep my dollars and my wealth stored in a boring vehicle where I'm the one that gets to determine what risks I want to take with my money. I don't want the economy or other people coming in telling me, no, Hannah, you can't do that because of X, Y, and Z. Well, X, Y, and Z wasn't my fault, so why can't I do that, right? So, so that's what we're talking about with the infinite banking concept and the total control of your dollars. Like I said, the insurance company is never going to deny you a loan from your policy, let alone even a withdrawal if you want to start taking withdrawals from your policy. They're never going to deny you that. You, as the policy holder and owner, have first rights to all of that cash value inside of the policy. So I hope you can understand and see here why the only vehicle on the planet that we want to use for the infinite banking concept is a specifically engineered whole life policy. Now, one thing I'll say as well, Dave Ramsey, I agree with you. Whole life is a terrible investment, but a whole life, regular old 100% base premium policy. Sure. If you want to look at that as an investment, absolutely. That's a terrible investment, but you're not designing the policy properly for the infinite banking concept. What I mean is, is that when you engineer and design one of these policies properly, as soon as you put a dollar inside of that vehicle, immediately, my definition of immediately being within 30 days, immediately you have access to cash inside of your policy that you can take out and start using. So now, to bring it back, to bring it full circle, I just want y'all to understand the different vehicles, the different types that are out there. Like I said, this is no silver bullet. There's no silver bullet out there for anybody. But in my personal opinion, I feel like if you stand, if you stand in front of a mirror and when you breathe and you fog it up, I think everybody should be practicing the infinite banking concept. Because here's one thing Nelson teaches us, right? Nelson ta talks to us about how we should be in two businesses in our life. The first business is the one that we're passionate about, the one that supports our income and it, it gets us up every single day out of bed, right? That's the first business that we should be in. The second business is the banking business, the business that finances everything throughout your life. And truthfully, if the banking business was not there, all other businesses would fail and fall because of it. That's what we're talking about. I'm not talking about your investments of what you're doing with your money, what risk you're taking with your money. What I'm here teaching you and showing you is the banking concept and the banking process in your life. So I hope you can understand a little bit more about these three different vehicles. And now I just touched on three, you know, we can talk about mutual funds. We can talk about 529 plans. We can talk about the stock market, right? There's other vehicles out there, but when we're pertaining to life insurance and the banking concept, these are the top three that really come about. And I just want y'all to understand a little bit more about them. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Money Multiplier podcast. And I ask you, do your dollars make sense? So join us every week for another episode as we keep diving into IBC and the wonderful world of privatized banking and solving your money problems. So uh, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, The Money Multiplier. And hey, if you want to connect with me personally, you can follow my personal Facebook, uh, um, TikTok, Instagram. It's Hannah, spelled the same ways forwards and backwards, underscore Kessler, K-E-S-L-E-R. And uh, honestly, y'all, actually, if you stick, stuck around for this episode, send me an email, Hannah at themoneymultiplier.com and I will send you a copy of our free ebook. The ebook is called Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery. You can go find it on Amazon if you like or go buy it from our website. But I will send you a copy of our free ebook that my father, Brent Kessler, and our close colleague, friend, uh, my personal mentor as well, Chris Noggle, wrote together. So that's my gift for you on this episode of the Money Multiplier Podcast. And until then, I'll catch you next time. Bye, y'all.